All right. Good morning. My name is Katie Damrat. I am the coordinator of adult programs at the uh, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Um, it is my pleasure this morning to welcome my colleague Courtney Morano, the interpretation manager and ancient art educator, um, to give her talk um, on stories of the Trojan War. And I will pass it off to you, Courtney. Thank you so much, Katie. Perfect. Um, Hi, uh, as Katie said, I'm Courtney Morano, and I'm happy to be here with you today to talk about stories of the Trojan War. Um, so we're going to look at, obviously, three pieces um, that are across time. Um, they represent about just about 200 years um, in, in history. But I wanted to sort of set up um, just a little bit of background about what do we mean when we talk about stories about the Trojan War. Um, of course, many of you know um, this is, sorry, my computer wanted to restart. Um, this is the great war between the Greeks and the Trojans. Um, you know, some thoughts out there about whether this was a mythological war. Does it capture some sort of legendary battle um, that actually occurred? Or again, was it was it mythological? But um, many people think that the Trojan War in some form um, did exist and maybe in the, about the 13th century BC. So over um, 3,300 years ago, potentially. And our most famous account of the Trojan War is really that of, um, of the poet Homer. Um, and that probably wasn't a written account. He probably just took all of these oral accounts and, and put them into some sort of a, a more standardized format. So, and Homer's Iliad would have been written, written, I say, um, again, probably more of an oral tradition um, or composed in about, I think maybe 750, 700 BC. So, you know, 400 years after the events of the Trojan War um, might have taken place. So, you know, even Homer is looking back to whether it's a legendary or um, mythological past or an actual um, battle. You know, he's sort of looking back to this, this grandeur and it sort of took on this, um, you know, sort of the status. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is the way in which people viewed things from the past and, and how those stories sort of um, become symbolic, you know, sort of in, in your own time, but as representations of um, sort of an illustrious past. So it's a battle between the Greeks and um, the Trojans. And we'll look at the first work and think about um, what sort of kicked off this war. So this is an image. Um, this is a, a French painting um, by an artist named Favre, um, and it's it's of the judgment of Paris. Um, so this might be a story um, familiar to, to many of you, but just to sort of center ourselves on this story that really was the beginning of, of this great war. We have some figures um, from left to right. We have the Trojan prince Aeneas, um, and he is holding an apple. Um, and the woman right in front of him is the goddess of, of love and beauty, Aphrodite or Venus. And then we have Athena in the middle and then Hera um, far to the right. And the little figure there um, next to Aphrodite is, is Cupid. So just a, a, winged, um, a winged figure often associated Cupid or Eros, um, sort of the god of love. Um, so the situation here is... Why Why are these three goddesses in front of Paris? Um, well, it all started with an event um, that precedes this one that we see here. There was a, a wedding between a king named Peleus and a, a sea nymph or Nereid named um, Thetis. So they had their wedding and they did not want to invite the goddess of discord. Um, not a big shock. No one really wants the goddess of discord in, in most places, let alone your, your wedding. So they didn't invite Eris, the goddess of discord. Um, well, she thinks, well, I'll get back at you for doing that. So she takes a golden apple um, and on this apple is inscribed for the fairest. And she sort of rolls that apple into, into the celebration in this wedding. And of course, everyone's like, well, that's me, I'm, I'm the fairest. So three goddesses that you see here, Aphrodite, Athena and Hera say, that's me. I'm the fairest, that's that's obviously meant for me. Um, that was not going to be resolved easily. So they asked Zeus, king of the gods, to resolve this. Um, and he says, absolutely not. I don't want to get involved in this. Um, so he has Hermes, who you can actually see in the sky up here, the messenger god. 
he has Hermes lead these three goddesses to to the Trojan prince um, Paris because he had judged a, a previous contest and and sort of went against himself um, and chose uh, chose another god as having won this contest. So it was thought that he was he was very fair um, and very just. Um, so each of the goddesses offers Paris something in exchange for for choosing them. Hera, the queen of the gods, offers him um, great land and, and wealth and power. Athena, goddess of war and wisdom, offers him uh, great um, victory in battle. Um, but Aphrodite offers him um, the love of the most uh, beautiful woman in the world, um, which we know as Helen of Troy. But um, at the time, she would have been known as Helen of Sparta because she was actually married to King Menelaus of Sparta. So Paris chooses um, Aphrodite's gift, and I and I say gift because there's a lot to um, a lot of thoughts about you know a woman um, being offered up as a gift. Um, but in any case, he he chooses this um, he chooses this this promise of Helen. Um, Helen and Paris run off together. They run off to Troy. Um, and, and that's really what kicks off the Trojan War. The Greeks, in, in an effort to get um, Helen back, the, all of the Greek forces sort of unite um, and then begin the, the Trojan War, um, all apparently to, to get Helen back. Um, so that's, that's really what kicks off this war. Now, this story, um, you know, as, as told by Homer, it also existed in, in other formats. Sorry, this story actually, let me back up. The, the Judgment of Paris is just a really passing reference in the Iliad. Um, and so that is because most of the Greeks at the time would have known this story from, um, from all of it, kind of like a, your favorite bedtime story, your favorite, um, you know, myth or um, just stories that you're familiar with. People would have been really familiar with these stories. So Homer didn't necessarily see the, the reason to sort of rehash this. Um, it, you know, in the Iliad. So again, it existed in other formats, other epic cycles um, and things like that. So it's really just a passing reference. Um, but this would have been really important. This story and, and the, the events of the Trojan War were really foundational to how the Greeks um, saw and thought about themselves. Um, and then the Romans after them, I and mean, there's deep connections as well. Um, and this continued. So the, the image that we're looking at um, is obviously French, was done in 1808. Um, and sort of thinking about what's going on at that time, this is just after the French Revolution. It's Napoleonic France. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but it's also in a, a period of time where the style of neoclassicism is, <clears throat> is, is all the rage. Um, and, and one reason this is um, due to the discovery of the towns of Herculaneum, which you see just a little more modern image of on the top there, discovered in 1738. So these towns in Italy, um, 1738, Herculaneum is discovered, and 10 years later, Pompeii um, is discovered in all these towns around the Bay of Naples. Um, so not only just thinking about the ruins that have existed in Rome for thousands of years by this point, but you've got the discoveries of these two towns um, that are really having an impact on what people are seeing and thinking about antiquity and, and how they're kind of looking back to the past um, as ideal. Um, and I just I love this quote from um, Johann Winkelmann, who is sometimes known as the father of art history. So this concept of modern and of course, modern here, we're talking about the 18th century. Um, they can only become great and un unequaled by imitating the ancients. So there's this idea of imitating the ancients is, is going to make you great. So that's kind of the, the spirit of what's, uh, what's going on in terms of um, thinking about art um, and architecture, but also politically. So thinking about um, aligning your politics um, with, with that of the Greeks and Romans, you know, thinking about democracies and Republican style uh, governments. Of course, there's a lot to unpack there about who, you know, who had access to democracy um, and, and the government. But th so this is a very sort of Western um, elite perspective, but um, in the context of what we're looking at, that is, that is how it fits. So if we think about the context of this work of art being done um, 
in 1808, um, Napoleon is ruling, you know, how might neoclassicism be viewed? And these are just some general thoughts on um, the importance of uh, looking back to the ancients. So the, the very fact that you are, are looking to antiquity for the stories, um, for the style of the art, so being influenced by the, the style of classical art, like all of those things just in and of themselves mean something and have these sort of moralistic um, undertones or, or even overtones. Um, representing things from the classic past sort of meant you could align yourself with those virtues. Um, and then also we might think about the situation of the story of the judgment of Paris, you know, where there's some... Um, Thoughts about, you know, each story can take on a deeper meaning, you know, great battles, vic victory and battles, aligning yourself with the great gods and goddesses um, and heroic figures like Paris, um, political allegiances, people being offered things and taking things. Um, so there's just definitely a lot of symbolism um, that these stories take on in a more contemporary context like um, <clears throat> early 19th century France. Um, and again, this is just more of a general sense of thinking about the style of art, neoclassicism, um, and this idea of aligning yourselves with um, the classical past meant you um, could be seen as having some of those same moral characteristics. You know, these these were the people to emulate. So, ergo, we are emulating them. And this this isn't um, specific to France, so we're going to kind of leave France and move on to America. Um, so if you were to be in the museum, you'd be heading to the American galleries. Um, and here is an image of um, uh, Priam returning to his family, the dead body of Hector. It was done in 1785 by an American artist named John Trumbull, who's known for um, his historic paintings. So we've kind of gone back in time. So it's, it's 1785, um, just after the American Revolution. And um, to kind of set up this story, I, I'm going kind of backwards um, in chrono chronology from the works of art that we're looking at, but I'm kind of following um, key events um, in chronological order uh, from the Trojan War itself. So it all started with the Judgment of Paris. Um, and this, what we see is sort of at the very end of a 10 year battle of the Trojan War. Um, and this actually um, is in Homer's Iliad. It's the last book of the Iliad. We see the great Trojan hero, um, Hector, whose body this is here. And his father um, is the older gentleman sort of right near him, that's Priam. And the women in the back here, we have Andromache, that is Hector's wife, um, his, his mother, Hecuba. And then this is Helen, um, Helen of Troy. Um, so they're receiving the body. So the story here is that at the end of the war, I'm so sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, Hector is killed uh, by Achilles, the great Greek warrior Achilles. And Achilles really holds his body. Um, he's mad that Hector had killed his um, his friend, his paramour, um, Patroclus, and he is holding Hector's body for ransom. He does sort of horrible things. He drags the body around, but the gods um, on the Trojan side help protect Hector's body um, from, from being really, truly desecrated. Um, but Priam, in order to do what's right, in order to give Hector um, the proper funeral rites, decides to go to Achilles and beg for his son's body back. Um, so he goes to Achilles. He They call it a ransom because he does bring him, um, you know, lots of... of, um, of uh, you know, wonderful things to sort of exchange for his son's body. Eventually, Achilles um, does agree to give uh, Hector's body back. And so that's sort of what you see here is he um, Hector's body being returned by his father, um, you know, to his wife, his mother, um, and then Helen. So that way, you know, hopefully all of this will come to a conclusion and he can have the proper things um, proper burial rights done. So that's sort of the ancient context. Um, and it would have certainly had lots of meaning to those who would have understood that. 
excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of water. Um, but what about in the American context? So if we think about the year in which this was done, it's 1785. So again, just after the American um, Revolution has concluded. Um, so if we think about the Revolutionary War, um, the, the, the founding fathers were really interested in looking to the classical past, both in terms of the style of government. Um, so thinking about Greek democracy, or Republican, Roman Republican form of government um, with a, a Senate. So they're looking to the classical past for the government, but also again, just these, these ideas of moral um, virtue. And what's pointed out often when looking at this image is just the kind of the gentle, the calm nature of those um, who, are, who are in the painting. So this idea that, um, they're upholding civic duty despite the great tragedy. So what they are putting above all else is <clears throat> this, um, this role they have to perform these burial rites and to, to act within um, the proper way. Um, there's also, you know, this idea of reconciliation. So Priam, um, you know, went to retrieve the body and hopefully by having this um, dialogue with Achilles, hopefully there's some reconciliation between the Greeks and the Trojans. That didn't necessarily work out so great, um, but that, that's kind of a concept. And so if you think about that in the concept of the aftermath of the American Revolution, you can see some similarities there. Um, you know, the idea of family, so the importance of family, all of these things are, are virtues that a new country like America um, was trying to establish. And again, they're looking back to the past and they're, they're telling these stories. They're, um, you know, enjoying looking at these stories for what it reminds them of from the classical past, but also what it means um, really in that contemporary. <laughs> and just to say that extended obviously to uh, things like architecture. So they're not just looking back for forms of government and, and styles of, of painting. They're thinking about, you know, building this new, this new country and looking to the classical past for things like architecture. If our um, our capital here, which was done or was begun around the same time as as this painting, um, I know many many iterations of of our capital, but um, just to to show you, that's done about the same time. And again, looking to the classical past for these ideals and it's and it's more than just the style. So it's it's what the style indicates about these sort of moral moral underpinnings. All right, we're going to move on to our last piece. So again, we're going we're going back in time and we're moving um, to a Flemish artist um, who was born in France, um, de Collery. Um, and this is actually just a, a, a new acquisition for us. It's on display in our niche. So if you were to come into our atrium, um, it is on display in a little special uh, niche just for another week and a half or so, I think. Uh, so you can come and check that out. But what we see here is sort of um, later in the later in the Trojan War, it's the the siege of Troy, um, the Trojan horse you can see right there is probably a story very, very familiar. So um, the Greeks decide that the way to sort of um, get through the walls of Troy uh, are they build this giant wooden horse, they hide all of the soldiers inside, they offer it as a gift, the gates open, um, they lay in wait until people in Troy are asleep, and then the Greek soldiers, um, you know, get out of the horse and um, sort of lay siege to Troy. Um, so you see the Trojan horse here. Um, but really the focus of this painting, as the title gives us the clue, um, is the, so the Siege of Troy, but also Aeneas um, fleeing. Um, and you can see here that he's carrying his father and he's with his young son there on the right. Um, so Aeneas is another prince of Troy, another um, warrior who was, who was mentioned in um, the stories of the Trojan War. Um, again, he is Trojan. Um, and what you see here is he's going to be leaving, but he's he's not leaving without his father. So he escapes with his father, um, who he needs to carry, and he's um, got his son in tow. His wife, unfortunately, um, 
did not make it. But if you want to talk about a, a scene um, or a, a story in antiquity, it's really loaded <clears throat> with propaganda. This becomes really the um, key event. I'm so sorry. Um, Aeneas um, flees Troy, and he goes on to found um, a town that you often hear Aeneas founds Rome. He founds a town called Lavinium. Um, he, so he leaves Troy, he has all of these adventures, much like um, Odysseus, and then he eventually ends up on the shores of um, Italy and form, um, founds a town called um, Lavinium, which close enough to Rome, his, one of his uh, descendants, Romulus, actually goes on to found Rome. But this is all captured in um, the Aeneid of Virgil. So this is a poem written in the uh, first century BC, and it was a poem that was actually commissioned by, we believe commissioned by the Roman emperor Augustus. So he wants to connect himself with the Trojans, right? So there were stories about, you know, various Trojans escaping and founding cities. Um, so it's, it's kind of an act of propaganda to sort of, you know, connect himself with the past, um, you know, to tell this great story of, of Rome's beginnings and, and connect it to, um, to the Trojans and this legendary past. Um, so you've got all of that in the story of Aeneas. Um, and Aeneas is also known for um, being pious. So you often hear him referred to as Aeneas the Pious. Um, so he is um, known to have been very dedicated um, to to religion um, and to obviously piety towards his father. You know, he's he's escaping with his father here. Um, he and one reason is he sort of took these um, what they call the household gods, these sort of sculptures um, with him on the way. So um, that's one reason that he's referred to um, as pious. I want to call your attention to something in the, the forefront here, this little plaque here. And again, to kind of connect this more specifically to Rome. So this is, it's an image in the background um, the artist has used. It's sort of this combination of, of more ancient look um, with more modern, some of the monuments and things that you would see would have been contemporary to Rome in the early 17th century. But there's this plaque here and it says SP. QT. <clears throat> so that means um, you might have heard of SPQR, the Senate and the people of Rome. So you see this on monuments in Rome. It, um, again, it just means the Senate and the people of Rome. It's currently, I believe, on some of the football jerseys um, of the, the Roman team, um, sort of ebbs and flows being, being on their jerseys or not, but it's it's something you see in and around Rome. So it was a really important symbol of, um, of ancient Rome and the virtues that they stood for. And in this case, um, De Colliery has said SBQT, so the Senate and the people of Troy. So even more connecting Rome with that, with that past, with that, that battle um, of Troy. But if we think about, you know, this and how this is being received, we are... It's, this was done in 1610. Um, the artist was Flemish. He's in France a lot. He's working in Rome. Um, so at the time we are, we're in the midst, still in the midst, I say it's, it's been going on for almost a hundred years, but the Protestant Reformation um, and the, the Catholic Reformation. So you have, um, you know, a lot going on between the Protestants and the Catholics, um, too much to, to get into in our remaining time together. Um, but one thought about the me deeper meaning of this painting is that, you know, you're connecting um, the story of Troy with Rome and sort of this idea of victory. So in Rome, guess where the, the Pope is? The Pope is in Rome. So this might represent um, the idea of Catholic supremacy over Protestant. Protestantism. Um, and that's one thing that's going on in Flanders at the time. So where our artist is, is Flemish. Um, so there's this thought that it's really showing um, the primacy of Rome and the Pope um, 
And those can be sort of linked um, to stories about thinking about Aeneas, you know, this, this idea of um, divine intervention, you know, the intervening of the gods and goddesses to help him do this. And so thinking about um, early 17th century um, concept of divine intervention, um, again, piety being connected with the piety of Aeneas, um, thinking of ways to renew the church. Um, so all of these sort of moralistic um, uh, themes can sort of arise um, from this image of, of Aeneas fleeing Troy, if you're looking at it from the context of the, of the Protestant and the Catholic Reformation. So I think that kind of concludes our um, stories of the Trojan War. Again, we went very quickly through France, um, America, and then sort of finally ended um, with a work by a Flemish artist. Thank you so much, Courtney. This was really great. Thank you so much for everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.